What's up, everybody? Welcome to a very special edition of The Hub on LA TV. I'm your host, Bruno Siros Ulloa. On today's show, we're doing things a little bit differently. Uh, instead of our usual segments, we are highlighting a digital segment that we produce here called WICA, which stands for What You Know About. And this segment highlights all kinds of people, artists, creators, writers, directors, anyone who contributes to Latin culture. And basically, we wanna highlight little known names that have done really, really big things for Latinos around the world. So to kick it off, what do you know about Latino inventors? We Latinos have innovation in our blood. From the ancients of Mesoamerica, who brought us rubber, astronomy, and chocolate, to current Latino inventors like Cuco, who invented being cool sad. Cool sad is where you're so sad, it's lit, and you should be headlining festivals. When it comes to modern inventions, we wanna make sure we give credit where credit is due, to some dope Latino inventors saving baby lives, beefing up cybersecurity, and keeping passengers safe. So tell me, what you know about Latino inventors? Here's three underrated Latino inventors they do not teach you about in school. Claudio Castillon Levano. This Peruano inventor is a hero to parents all over the world. He's credited with inventing the neonatal artificial bubble. I know, it sounds like something designed to keep people out of my millennial personal space, but in fact, it's something way cooler and way more useful. Although I do, I need one of those. When confronted with the fact that Latin America and the Caribbean accounted for approximately 4% of the world's neonatal deaths in 2017, with an estimated 102,522 newborn deaths across the region, Levano and his team tackled the problem head on and developed the neonatal artificial bubble, which is designed to improve the intensive medical care of high-risk newborns. It's essentially a portable incubator with a respirator known as the IncuVent. Even without intensive care, 75% of neonatal deaths are preventable if babies are kept warm in a hygienic environment with regulated oxygen and breathing, which are literally all the things Claudio Castillon Levano's incredible invention provides. This dope invention is going to save countless lives around the world, and we have a brilliant Peruano to thank for it. Victor Ochoa is a Mexican inventor who might be the dude who best fits what you think of when you think inventor. While other people are experts in a particular field who create and then patent their inventions, Victor Ochoa seems like the kind of guy who just thinks of stuff off the top of his head. For example, he's credited with inventing an adjustable wrench. You know, it's that tool we think of when someone says wrench or when we think we can totally fix whatever's making a sink drip water, when actually we're gonna flood the downstairs neighbors and blame those rusty old pipes. However, Victor Ochoa's electric brake patent in 1907 is really what sets him apart. It's an ingenious brake system that uses magnetic attraction to cause trains to slow down, kind of in the same way I use my romantic attraction to slow down any attempt to escape the friend zone. Even though that's Victor Ochoa's most prestigious invention, I'm a bigger fan of his Ochoa plane invention, which is a 20-year project he's been working on that involves two bicycles, weighs 250 pounds, has a six-horsepower engine, and massive magnets that are all meant to make the thing mimic the movement of a bird with six wings. Which, in my book, wins as invention of the century on whimsy alone. But definitely, Victor Ochoa gets a page in the history books for his game-changing electric brakes. Guatemala-born Dr. Luis Von Ahn is one of the pioneers of crowdsourcing because his award-winning PhD thesis was the first publication to use the term human computation in 2005, which describes things that combine human brain power with computers to solve problems. Most importantly though, he's the dude who invented CAPTCHA codes. These codes help keep our digital information safe, and many of our favorite websites fight spam, trolls, and bots out to do us harm. So, I guess Luis Von Ahn wanted to make sure, since we were combining the brain power of humans with computers, that we're all aware which is which. So, the next time you're guessing which square is a street sign or trying to decipher words out of a psychedelic pattern, 
it's because Guatemalan Luis Von An decided that's how we know you're not a robot and a human with emotions and a respectable Venmo balance. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to The Hub on LA TV. Up next, we're talking Scarface. That's right, everybody's favorite cult classic. Seems like, what else is there to know? Well, turns out there's a lot to know because when it first came out, it was not well received by everyone, especially the Cuban community. So to tell you more, here's our very own Cuban, Mr. Humberto Guida. Say hello to my little friend. Everyone knows the lines, everyone loves that movie. Well. In the beginning, not everybody loved that movie. In fact, it started as a real bumpy ride. So tell me something, what you know about Scarface? Scarface, yes, the 1983 crime thriller starring Al Pacino as a Cuban gangster that is today regarded as a cult classic, especially among millennials, including Latinos, and yes, Cuban Americans like myself. You see, me and my friends who grew up in Miami all loved the film. We have the iconic black and white movie poster in our rooms. Some of us even have custom t-shirts with our face in place of Al Pacino's Tony Montana character. So if you base it on my generation and younger, you'd think Cubans always love this movie. How could they not? It's about a Cuban badass. Hello. But here's the thing. Before Scarface came out, even as it started filming, the Cuban community in Miami hated the idea of this film. And when production began in 1982, the Cuban exile leaders staged massive protests as they filmed. They couldn't even finish production in Miami. In fact, just a couple of weeks into filming, the entire shoot had to be moved to Los Angeles because the Cuban community would not let them shoot the movie in peace. Why? Simple. They felt the film's portrayal of a Cuban refugee's rise through the criminal underworld was damaging to the Cuban community's reputation especially at a time when they were already being blamed for Miami's increasing crime and poverty rates, not to mention rapidly changing culture and demographics. You see, before the Cuban Revolution and the subsequent exodus of hundreds of thousands of Cuban refugees, Miami was a sleepy southern beach town that up until as late as the 1950s had things like segregated schools and water fountains for colored people. And now they had to deal with a bunch of Latin Americans coming in and basically taking over and speaking Spanish. It was a lot of change in a short amount of time and led to what is commonly referred to as white flight. But by 1980, Cuban exiles had gained some ground. They were firmly entrenched in South Florida, both politically and economically. They were finally getting some respect. They had done as much as any other immigrant group in American history to buy into the American dream and assimilate into American culture. Well, kinda. But then came the Mariel Boatlift. It started with an announcement that a large anti-communist protest had broken out at a harbor in Cuba. And it was followed by a proclamation by the Cuban government that any American with a boat who wanted to come and pick up their friends or relatives were free to do so. So a flotilla of thousands of boats left marinas across South Florida within hours. It was like a Cuban Dunkirk. And when they arrived in the Cuban harbor, they were allowed to claim their people, but under one condition. Each boat that took on refugees had to also take their share of freshly released criminals. You see, the Castro regime took the opportunity to empty many of its prisons and ship their ex felons to Miami. Touche, comandante, touche. The result was a humanitarian nightmare and a municipal mess, with many of these unclaimed Marialitos held in 10 cities under the I-95 freeway overpass for months where riots broke out, while some were just incarcerated in Miami's jails for no reason. Let's just say the following couple of years had its challenges and divisions began to crystallize among the Cuban community itself, with many innocent Marialitos shouldering the blame for Miami being labeled as a paradise lost. And now they had this movie with all this buzz fear about a Marielito refugee, an ex-felon released from Castro's jail coming to wreak havoc in the streets of Miami. For many, it was too soon. And that the pop culture idea of a Cuban was a feisty guy snorting insane amounts of cocaine and shooting machine guns across his hella tacky red velvet walled mansion, it felt like a public relations disaster to Cubans at the time. And on top of that, they didn't even cast the Cuban actors the central character. The sidekick, played by Steven Bauer, whose real name is Esteban Ernesto Echeverria, he's Cuban. But the star, oh no, he's Al Pacino, who by the way does the worst Cuban accent in the history of Cuban accents in this film, and which for some reason he kept doing for the rest of his career. 
scent of a woman, that was Tony Montana. Now, over the years, and with the separation to the emotional traumas felt by the first wave of Cuban immigrants, the kids of those Cubans who protested Scarface, like me, we started watching the film. Coincide that with hip hop's obsession with this Cuban gangster, and you can understand how a Cuban or any Latino my age or younger might think Scarface is the And at the end of the day, when you get past the socio-political context, the bad acting, the gratuitous violence, the campy Giorgio Moroder soundtrack, and that horrible accent, Scarface is a pretty good movie. And like Tony Montana likes to say, it's the last time you're gonna see a bad guy like this again, let me tell you. What up, y'all? Welcome back to The Hub on LA TV. Coming up next, we're talking street art. Now, I know most of you have probably heard of people like Banksy, but before Banksy, and I mean way before Banksy, there were four students from Garfield High School right here in LA who changed the landscape of street art forever. No one knows what he looks like, but everyone knows his work. Banksy's illegal street art installations and pranks on the bougie art scene make him the internet's favorite renegade artist. But decades before Banksy stenciled his first wall, it was four Latino graduates of Garfield High who took on the establishment and ended up permanently redefining street art as a whole. So tell me, what you know about Asco? If you're cooking up a menudo of dope revolutionary art, then the 70s would have had all the ingredients necessary. While the summer of love and civil rights movements were simmering in the background and New York's new school art movement was ripening, issues in our community of displacement, segregation, and racism were roasting in open flames. This turned out to be the perfect recipe for the creation of the Asco Art Collective, a defiant group of artists fed up with their culture being marginalized, disrespected, and even ignored altogether. This art collective chose to call themselves Asco, as in gross. Asco as in soggy, bland, gentrified chilaquiles. Que asco. In 1972, 21-year-old Harry Gamboa Jr. went to the LACMA in Los Angeles and discovered that not a single Mexican or Chicano artist was included in any of their modern art exhibits. When he confronted a museum curator and asked why there's no Chicano art on the walls, he was told, Chicanos don't make art, they join gangs. That night, three of the four friends who would form Asco a year later, Harry Gamboa Jr., Willie Hedron, and Gronk, pulled up to the LACMA and spray painted their names on the wall, sticking it to the museum, both by tagging their names on the wall gangster style, but more importantly, claiming the entire museum in their city funded by Latino Barrio tax dollars as their very own piece of conceptual art. It was kind of a, how you like me now, I say. And in what is now an immortalized picture, Patsy Valdez, the fourth member of Asco, is seen posing in front of the signatures. The piece was entitled Spray Paint LACMA. The irony, you might ask? This iconic photograph has been featured as part of several exhibits at the LACMA and other prestigious museums since. In the early 70s, as a Chicano in East LA, there was a lot to be disgusted by, not the least of which was the fact that though Chicanos made up about 6% of the population, they accounted for 20% of the casualties in the Vietnam War. Spray paint the LACMA is the most talked about and recognized piece by Asco. Even by today's standards, their work stands out as dramatic, eye-catching, provocative and true to their Latino roots. When you think of popular street art today, it's more about how clever a stenciled phrase or image can be. Live, laugh, love. Are you kidding? But the dudes of Osco took their creativity to the next level. For example, they created instant murals by literally taping their friends to a wall, which I've only seen white people do on Instagram after losing a bet. They would create no movies, film stills from movies that didn't exist. They would create scenes and shoot a single 35 millimeter frame. As Gronk explained, it is projecting the real by rejecting the real. Asco even organized spontaneous plays or scenes in restaurants, processions on popular sidewalks, and performance pieces in the middle of Whittier Boulevard. First Supper After a Major Riot is a performance piece they arranged on a traffic island of Whittier Boulevard. 
Right on the spot where four years before police had opened fire on protesters, the Osco Art Collective staged a dinner party, complete with masks, weird attire, and an inflatable baby Jesus. Before cops could even be called, the performance was photographed and the artists were nowhere to be seen. Ultimately, the collective disbanded in 1987, but their impact on street art and culture in general is everywhere. Before Osco, Latino and Chicano art seemingly had to be painted on murals with indigenous imagery to be respected. And of course, muralists like Orozco, Rivera, and Siqueiros deserve their props. But Asco took it that one step further and looked pretty dope doing it. Welcome back, Familia. I'm Bruno, and you're watching The Hub on LA TV. Coming up, we're gonna hear from Levi Ponce, who is a muralist that's gone under the radar for way too long. He's responsible for two Kobe Bryant murals, the Nipsey Hussle mural, and a lot of well-known art that is all over Los Angeles. And unfortunately, street artists especially don't get the kind of credit they deserve. So instead of having a host like me or Umberto this time, we're gonna hear directly from the man himself. Here's Levi Ponce. The murals have always been around. Since the caves in France, the Sistine Chapel, murals have always been around. The reason that it resonates so much with Latinos is because of the things that were happening in Mexico City with Diego Rivera and all them in that era. They were leveraging muralism not just for the art form, but for political reasons. You gotta realize that the masses were largely uneducated and couldn't read. So this was a way to communicate what was going on in the country politically to the masses. Art was never a choice. Art was the family business. My dad's a painter, sign painter by trade. He's been painting signs in San Salvador, Ciudad Delgado. Like, he started painting when he was 11. He would do people's uh, cards for Dia de los Muertos. And, you know, they got paid like 10 cents a card. But my dad made 20 cents a card because he did, old, like, Old English. So it was never really an option. It was, it, was, it was in my blood, it was in my genes, and it was the family business. He would paint a sign, he'd finish, but there's leftover paint. Your brushes are out and there's an alley, and it's ugly, and there's graffiti. And it's like, well, let me clean this up and paint something that I wanna paint. So my dad would paint things that range from Saddam Hussein and Osama bin Laden and Santa Hats to, you know, Thalia. So it would be like pop art, it would be funny, it would be a political statement. And I saw that, and not only that, I saw the difference it made in the communities in which he painted. And I saw the way that people were affected. People would come out and hold his hands and pray over the walls. There's ways of putting messages out there, even controversial messages, without putting up blight or ruining or vandalism or, or doing something negative in your community. You can achieve the same message with something beautiful. A lot of murals really inspire me and inspired me growing up. One was Steve McQueen by Kent Twitchell. It's in Pico Union where I grew up, so I would often see it driving home. And it would baffle me. How did he get it to look that real? It looks like a photo. How did he do it, right? And it would inspire me because, you know, I wasn't that good technically. And so seeing somebody that's that good technically pushes you to get there. And another mural that was big was We Are Not a Minority with Che Guevara over in Boyle Heights. I think uh, those two kind of sum up, you know, what I'm all about. It's, it's, it's all about improving our neighborhoods, representing ourselves, and doing it so in a way that is beautiful, aesthetically pleasing, and is welcomed by communities and improves the aesthetic of our communities. I was really proud of the Mona Lisa. I don't always go out there and put out political statements, but the, Mo the Mona Lisa was basically a big finger saying, we're gonna paint. From 2001 to 2012, I believe, uh, I could be wrong, it was illegal to paint murals in Los Angeles, but over a decade, the moratorium prevented large-scale imagery from going up on walls. And I thought that was wrong. And I thought what we were doing was a good thing. And I painted the Mona Lisa because she represents the art, she represents the artist, and she's got a rifle at her back and a sword in hand and a big old sombrero just like, you know, the Adelitas of the Mexican Revolutionary War. It was a fight and she represents the artists fighting for the arts and that's what we were doing in Pacoima. We were painting murals dozens at a time at a time when it was illegal to paint murals in Los Angeles because we believed in it and the Mona Lisa represents that. 
To start off, I wanted to represent Latino people and Latino communities. I was painting a lot of celebrities. I was painting a lot of well-known people. In time, I turned around and started painting well-known works of art, but I would put a Latino twist on them. Uh, the girl with the pearl earring, I turned into the girl with the hoop earring. You know, pearls were very popular at the time. That's the reason why she's wearing a pearl, and that's the reason why it's in that painting. In my neighborhood, it was all about the hoops. So I found a way to kind of segue our community into that piece of art. I can't fly all of Pacoima out to see the painting, but I can steal the painting and bring it to Pacoima. So after that, I started painting a lot of locals. I realized that, you know, uplifting celebrities, I could uplift everyday people, right? Why not? And so now I try and paint not just celebrities, but people who also represent our culture in a positive way, be it somebody's grandmother, be it, you know, a hardworking person, another artist, whatever it may be, we try and represent our community with our art. I rediscovered Nipsey Hussle through the tragedy that occurred. I was always familiar with his music, but through his passing, I discovered all his work in his community, and his philosophy is so on point. I think, you know, do what you can for your community today. Go out there, be an entrepreneur, do it for yourself, and improve your community. Invest in your own community. I want to echo Nipsey's legacy. I want to make sure that that message continues on. So I was very inspired, and I went out and painted a mural the next day, and, uh, you know, I hope people enjoy it, and I hope it, again, carries his legacy further than than his life did. As soon as I'm done with the mural, it's no longer mine. It belongs to the community, and I welcome the community to use it. Personally, I don't believe you need permission to do something right, which is why I've never gone through a 60-day process to put up a mural. If that was the case, we'd still be waiting for Nifty's mural. You don't need permission to go out and do something right. All of my work, the vast majority of it, is illegal, meaning I didn't go through the city to register my mural before putting it up. Why did I do that? Because I believe in it. I believe that what we're doing is right. I believe that what we do improves the communities. I believe that what we do improves the aesthetic of our communities, and I believe that the communities in which I do it welcome it. So I don't think I need to go through the city. And to this day, none of my murals have been erased. None of them have been an issue with the city. In fact, the city has turned around and <laughs> awarded all the people that you know we work with, and, and, and it's been you know embraced. With a gallery, you tend to be interested in the artist or the theme or the gallery or whatever it may be, and it caters only to a certain segment of the population. What I love about murals is that, again, it's there for everybody to take in and everybody to absorb. It's a beautiful thing.